Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor Vignette Series. And we're going to sum up the complex information you've received about the hip with some new developments in hip imaging. And our focus in this first summation vignette is going to be on the labrum. Now the normal labrum consists of dense fibrocartilage, but it's actually not true fibrocartilage throughout. It's got a triangular shape in cross-section. It's a bit thicker and more triangular and more substantial in the back. And that's why this posterior labrum is prone to fracture, rupture, and tear with posterior dislocation, which is the common form of dislocation. The labrum attaches to an osseous acetabular rim, and this attachment is a very narrow zone of transition. And there's also a narrow zone of transition between it and the adjacent hyaline cartilage, as we'll soon see. There is a transverse acetabular ligament that closes the ring of the acetabulum, depicted here in green. From the transverse acetabular ligament comes the ligamentum teres. The yellow color that you see represents the pulvinaric fat in the joint space. The labrum deepens the acetabulum. It is not important for load transmission, but is very relevant for subtle movements of internal and external rotation, abduction, and adduction. Now here are two high-resolution MR images of the hip, one a paracoronal, the other a paraaxial. The paraaxial is obtained by taking a line and bisecting the femoral head, neck, and trochanteric region to create this appearance. A series of paraaxial images may be used to evaluate things like antiversion, retroversion, bumps, and cysts. What do we mean by antiversion and retroversion? In the condition of antiversion, the posterior acetabular labrum should line up with the center of the femoral head. If it protrudes too far to the viewer's right or laterally, there is posterior overcoverage, and we say that the patient suffers from antiversion. On the other hand, the anterior acetabular labrum should always be medial to the posterior labrum or slightly to the viewer's left relative to the posterior labrum. If it is too large and there is overcoverage such that it protrudes to the viewer's right beyond the position of the posterior labrum, we say that the patient suffers from retroversion. We'll use this paraxial to evaluate the shape of the head, the tapering of the femoral neck. Lack of tapering may infer or imply the diagnosis of CAM1 impingement. This is where we'll look for bumps and cysts. The paraxial shows the strong, powerful iliofemoral ligament in the front, the ischiofemoral ligament in the back, a synechiae, in the back, the fovea capitis with some fat and the ligamentum teres, and the anterior and posterior capsule whose capsular ligament makes the boundary for the intraarticular space to the viewer's left and the extraarticular space to the viewer's right. On the other hand, the coronal may be obtained from an orthogonal axial the coronal bisects the femoral head, neck, and trochanteric region. The coronal is used also to assess the tapering from the head to the neck. Lack of tapering, especially in this region right here, once again, implies the diagnosis of CAM1 impingement. We see the labrum and its narrow transition with the bony acetabulum, the strong iliofemoral ligament, the transverse acetabular ligament. Coming from it, the ligamentum teres spreading out and inserting on the fovea capitis with its ischial and pubic heads. And there is a subtle area of invagination representing the capsular ligament, and one can imagine a line being drawn across in this region representing the zona abicularis with everything to the viewer's supero left being intraarticular and infra right being extra-articular. The microscopic anatomy of the labrum 
is more complex than just simply a fibrocartilage structure. For it isn't really all fibrocartilage. It's a combination of fibrocartilage in the inner surface, the articular surface, and then collagen fibers that are lamellar in the middle, and then peripherally, they're a bit longitudinal. These fibers blend with the transverse ligament, which makes for a stratified appearance of the labrum. Darker, deeper, lighter, more superficial. The blood supply to the labrum is via capsular blood vessels, but the blood supply is poor, making the labrum a structure with limited self-healing capabilities. As stated, the labrum deepens the joint, seals the joint, and distributes forces in internal and external rotation, abduction, and adduction. Here's a higher resolution view of the labrum, demonstrating stratification. Darker, deep, lighter, more superficial. More fibrocartilage-like, more collagen-like. A sublabral sulcus, which is found in the 8 o'clock position, just below the anterior equator of the hip, slightly in the antero inferior quadrant, is seen as a structure that is more smooth and rounded in the coronal projection and a little bit more knife blade or thinner in the axial projection. The narrow transition between the acetabular labrum and the hyaline cartilage and the bony acetabulum is apparent on this high resolution image. One sees the hyaline cartilage of the acetabulum, the capsule as a thin, dark band, and then the hyaline cartilage of the femoral head. The strong iliofemoral ligament reflects several millimeters above the junction between the fibrocartilage and the acetabulum. This reflection, which is only a few millimeters, two or three millimeters in the young person, gets a little deeper and a little longer in the adult as the iliofemoral ligament strips with advancing age. Now the sublabral sulcus is a subject of enormous discussion and debate. For its differential diagnosis lies between a normal variant and a potentially catastrophic injury or tear. It's found in the anterior slightly inferior quadrant in the 8 o'clock position in its maximal depth. It fades or diminishes in size as one moves superiorly along the anterior clock face when viewing the hip in the sagittal projection. It is not knife blade unless one views it in the axial projection. It is not associated with paralabral cyst formation. It's shallow, less than 30, 40, or 50 percent of the labral depth, and it is slightly off vertical in its direction. In other words, it doesn't run straight up and down, and it doesn't run straight anterior to posterior. It's slightly obliqued. Here's an example of the sublabral sulcus in the 8 o'clock position, just below the equator, showing a somewhat more knife blade configuration in the axial projection. But it doesn't have depth on this three-dimensional, fast, steady-state, free procession image. It doesn't penetrate the anterior aspect of the labrum. It is not directly vertical in its orientation. There are no paralabral cysts. There are, there are no areas of swelling in or around the labrum. Here is the paralabral recess, and it deepens as one moves towards the 8 o'clock position. This is the acetabulum. Here is the mid-acetabulum. Just below the mid-acetabulum, or 9 o'clock position, the labral sulcus becomes apparent. To your right is the femoral head. So this would be anterior acetabulum, posterior acetabulum off the screen, superior to the left, the viewer's left, inferior to the viewer's right. The clinical manifestations of labral tear can be very variable. But it provides 22 percent of the increase in the articular surface. As mentioned, it is composed of dense connective tissue and collagen in the mid to outer fibers, fibrocartilage in the inner fibers. So there is an element of stratification, darker inner, lighter outer. As mentioned previously, there is no intrinsic blood supply to the labrum. There is some circumferential supply that comes from the outside to the inside, 
and also from the articular surface. But the very center of the labrum is relatively avascular. Therefore, it's common to see some higher signal intensity in the middle of the labrum as one ages, much like one sees signal intensity in the middle of the meniscus of the knee as one ages. Another caveat, traumatic labral tears from an acute traumatic event are more often labral detachments from the hyaline cartilage and the acetabulum rather than tears into the interstitium of the labrum itself. On the other hand, degenerative changes in the labrum as one ages, not detachment, but in the labrum itself, these are extremely common. Perhaps 60 to 80 percent of all patients over the age of 60 are going to have degenerative labral tears that do not necessitate an intervention. Well, this concludes our summary, our advanced summary of the labrum, and our vignettes will continue on the summation of hip anatomy, hip measurements, and some limited discussion, but advanced discussion of hip pathology as we finalize our information on advanced imaging of the hip. Thank you.